so hey everyone welcome to uh, uh another bay area nlp um we've been doing this one year remote and uh one of the nice things is is that we can get speakers who aren't necessarily in the in the, the same neighborhood um so i would say fresh from berlin but um <laughs> currently in melbourne typically in in berlin um it's a delight um uh to have the creators of uh spacey uh so innes and, and and matt uh from explosion uh so uh innes is a is a developer uh specializing in tools for ai and nlp technologies uh she's co-founder of explosion and core developer for spacey um uh and prodigy um the data annotation tool so a use case that is, is close to, to my heart um matt uh was the original creator of the spacey library um, and, you know, I just realized, like, in your, your bio here, so you started working in NLP research in 2005. Um, Matt, I'm pretty sure we worked together in NLP research in, like, 2003. Um, so I, <laughs> you, have, you have even more experience. Matt and I knew each other as undergraduates um, uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, that actually, so, you know, it, I think that that was, you know, if we talked in, 20, in 2003, that would have been when, you know, I was, hired for a research assistant position to like, you know, wrangle an XML data or something. Uh, so I don't count that as, you know, like, um, I think my first publication was 2004 or something. So Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I think research would be a strong word to apply to anything I did as an undergraduate. So, so I, <laughs> I think that's yeah. a, uh, that, that, that's a, a fair, fair distinction. Um, uh, and yeah, like I mentioned, um, uh, Matt is now typically based uh, out of Berlin, um, which is where, where Explosion is, is based. And I think um, has six or seven full-time developers. Am, am I right about that? Uh, yeah, um, at the moment, but we currently, um, things have been going well. We've been expanding our team a bit, so there'll be more people joining. Nice. Yeah. And and as I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call knows, um, uh space of course is one of the, the most widely used um nlp libraries um so very impressive that um a, a team of that size has built something so widely used i have certainly been on much bigger teams um building software that never got used so, <laughs> so it is it is quite an achievement um uh, so the format for today will, will be uh what is typical here in, in bay area nlp um so we'll play a, a pre-recorded talk which will go for about um, uh, for about 30 minutes. And um, during that time, you can chat with Innes and Matt um, in the text chat here in, in Zoom. Um, I take live questions, uh, comments, um, uh, share your experience about being on lockdown um, uh, during that period. And then following that, we will have uh, a live Q&A. Uh, and as a reminder, we, we are recording this talk. It'll, it'll be up to the presenters afterwards, whether or not we decide to, to publish this online. Um, so if you want to ask a question live following um, the, the presentation, but you're not comfortable being recorded, um, let us know in the chat. I can ask that question on, on, on your behalf and uh, so you can still get your question answered without uh, necessarily uh, being uh, recorded. And like I said, I will um, I'll remind you of that again at the, um, uh, at the start of the, the question time. All right. Um, so with that, please join us in the, the chat and I will uh, get the presentation going. We're the co-founders of Explosion and together with Sophie and Adrian, we're the co-developers of Spacey, an open source library for natural language processing in Python. Spacey's come a long way since its first release. It's been downloaded over 20 million times and by most measures, it's now one of the most popular Python packages. I had the idea to start Spacey when I was in academia. This was back in 2014, but there are already people in industry contacting me about the stuff I was writing for my papers. The problem was, academic programs are written to support an argument, so their ultimate objective, their mission in life, was to print a table of numbers and exit. That was their job, and I think they were pretty good at it, even when I was in academia I was trying to write good software. But you know, we can't talk about good without talking about for what. Every good program is going to be fit to its requirements. Design is all about trade-offs after all. My academic programs just weren't suitable for what the industry folks wanted to do. And this was more or less true for most of the NLP software that was around at the time. So I saw there was something missing from the ecosystem. And thus, Spacey was born. I left academia and released the first alpha version in early 2015 under the tagline Industrial Strength NLP. Focusing on production means we think about things that aren't that relevant to experiment code. We make sure the library is easy to deploy and practical to run on lots of text. 
We also focus on the developer experience. Getting the right conceptual model behind the API, consistent naming, good error handling, and great documentation. It's been great to see the library take off, and this great ecosystem of plugins and extensions grow up around it. We've been adding features to help the community extend Spacey for a long time now, but version 3 brings a whole new level of it. There's an awesome new config system, a workflow system to structure your projects, and lots more. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we get to any of that, we need to talk about transformers. Transformers are a type of deep learning model that's been very successful for NLP, especially when used with language model pre-training. The most important advantage of transformers is that they scale up better. As you add more parameters, transformers keep improving. They don't plateau, unlike earlier alternatives like CNN or LSTM. Transformers also use GPU hardware more efficiently, and GPUs have kept getting better and more powerful, while CPUs have been kind of stagnant. The huge transformer models from a few years ago now feel pretty practical. And researchers have shown that transformers will keep scaling up. They keep improving for at least the next few orders of magnitude and size. With a few years of algorithm and hardware advances, we might be able to run models as good as OpenAI's GPT-3 in production. So with all that context in mind, we're pleased to introduce a new family of trained pipelines based on transformer architecture. The pipelines On best on GPU. You will definitely want a GPU for training all them on CPU. Under the hood, the transformer-based pipelines use the Hugging Face Transformers library and PyTorch. You can use any PyTorch-based model that Hugging Face published very easily and out of the box. For the English transformer pipeline, we used the Roberta-based model that was published by researchers at Facebook shortly after the seminal BERT paper by Devlin et al., which showed the success of language model pre-training for large transformers. We fine-tuned the Roberta-based transformer for all the tasks in the pipeline, dependency parsing, part of speech tagging, and then entity recognition. We're really happy with the accuracies we've been able to achieve with the transformer-based pipeline so far. Using this approach, Spaces NER accuracy is now right up there with the current state of the art. The other components also get accuracies that are up to date with modern systems as well. There are definitely trade-offs with the transformer-based pipelines. There are more dependencies, GPUs are more expensive and less reliable, and latency can be a problem. On the other hand, you can see the system makes 30% fewer errors across these tasks, which can definitely be important. If you find yourself working on something and accuracy is the main blocker for you, definitely consider trying out the transformer. The transformer support in Spacey 3 is also very flexible, so you can build your own solutions. You're not limited to just the pipelines we've trained and distributed. Probably the feature that's most important is the ability to put the transformer weights into their own component, which other components in your pipeline will then connect to. This makes it really easy to do multitask learning. It's how we have one transformer powering the tag of parser and NER all at once. It makes a big difference for your performance because the transformer only has to run once, even if your pipeline consists of lots of separate components. We've also made sure the transformer-based pipelines behave just the way you'd expect other spacey pipelines to work when it comes to things like saving, loading, and installing the trained pipeline. The transformer-based pipelines save out the fine-tuned weights into the directory for you, so the directory is self-contained. You can test your artifacts, and when you're deploying the model, you don't have to worry about your workers downloading things at runtime. And if you package the model using the spacey package command, it can be installed via pip, and all the requirements will be specified for you, making installation really easy. Transformer-based pipelines are an example of a relatively complex way to arrange your pipeline. The transformer itself introduces a number of options, and then you have other components that need to connect to the transformer and set up their own options as well. There are many ways for this configuration to be wrong, resulting in a pipeline that can't run or won't learn anything useful. This is all really standard for machine learning, of course. Spacey is definitely not the only library that has to think about this. Every machine learning system is sitting on a big pile of configuration, always one flag away from blowing up. And the problem is pretty fundamental. It's what deep learning is, if you think about it. The whole promise of deep learning is that we can stack a relatively small number of layer types together to create complex systems. And then the optimization process introduces yet more settings as we're constantly tweaking the dynamics to try to guide the model to better solutions. So settings, settings everywhere. We've definitely felt the pain of letting the settings get out of control, and we think it's really an important problem. So we've put a lot of work into getting Spacey set up to do this right. Here's an example of a common problem that arises from configuration settings. It's really common to pass in configuration that gets passed from one function into another. Of course, each of those functions also has to have a usable API, so they're likely to have defaults. 
Passing all those defaults along is really error prone. It's hard to figure out where some value is getting injected, and it's hard to keep all the defaults aligned. You're also exposing a lot of details of the functions you're calling into the outer API, which really ties it to that one type of object it's constructing. If you later add the option to create a CNN or transformer here instead of an LSTM, you'll have a bunch of options that are only valid in some situations. That's when signatures really get out of control, and your IDE starts giving you those whole screen tooltips nobody wants to see. Here's an example snippet of Spacey's configuration. It's based on Python's built-in config parser module, with a few extensions. One is that we use JSON to pass the values, so you can easily make the values lists, mappings, and so on, using a simple and familiar syntax. Second, we follow Tommel's convention of using a dot notation in the section names to denote nested sections. This keeps each block simple and readable, and avoids the indentation problems that can arise in long config files. We're really happy with these syntactic conventions, and we think the resulting configs stay neat and easy to read. But the thing we're really proud of, and what we think really sets the config system apart, is the support for registered functions. Your config file can describe a function call or object creation by referring to a function that will be retrieved from an extensible table that we term the registry. In this example, the registry will look in its optimizers table for a function named according to the specified key, adam.v1. This function will then be called, with the other elements of the block passed in as arguments. In this example, the other argument is the learning rate, which is also created by a registered function. The configuration is resolved bottom-up, so the result of that function is computed, and the resulting object passed into Adam. In this example, the learning rate here will come from the schedules table, and it will actually be a generator, rather than a scalar value. I know that's a lot to take in, but I think it's worth taking a second here. What we're doing here is letting the tree of objects get built bottom-up instead of top-down. In a normal config system, you'd pass the optimizer settings for the learning rate, and the optimizer would go and construct the object. So all the config goes into the object at the top of the tree, and travels downwards, getting passed along the call chain. Instead, here the object only receives the configuration it needs itself, because it doesn't need to create any objects, it just gets the object instances. And this is achieved by the simple mechanism of having a registry system so you can refer to functions by name. Of course, the registry system wouldn't be much fun if you couldn't add things to it yourself. You're not limited to just the functions we write and register for you. It's really easy to register your own functions using this decorator. Behind the scenes, the config system does a lot of cool stuff for you. It looks at your function's signature and uses it to build a pedantic model that can be used to validate your config. So if your config specifies arguments that would result in an error, wrong names, missing required values, even type errors like passing a string instead of an int, we can raise an error for you right away. We don't need to just run everything and let you see some weird trace back five minutes later just because you made a typo. The config unifies several workflows that needed their own separate systems before. Saving a model to disk writes out the config file, and then the config is used to reconstruct the model when you call spacey.load. The config is also the single source of truth for training, especially when you're using the spacey train command from the CLI. You don't have to use the CLI, but we definitely recommend it. Training tends to take a long time, so there's lots of details about the progress statistics and error handling that are really convenient, so simple training scripts tend to grow more complex over time. The config system and the various callbacks mean that the spacey train command is very flexible, so even if you need custom logic, there's probably a way you can get the CLI to do what you need. The CLI also adds a few cool features that really improve the developer experience. You can quickly set up a new config file using the recommended defaults given the pipeline you're trying to train. You can even tell it about the trade-offs that are relevant to you, so it can recommend a config that's tuned for accuracy rather than speed, or vice versa. Once your config is ready, you then pass it as an argument to the spacey train command. And that's really all you need. The config has all the settings. You can also specify overrides on the command line using a consistent notation. So you don't need to edit the file to change some setting, even if it's buried deep in a subsection. This is especially handy for hyperparameter tuning. The config system is another great step in the CLI experience that we've been building for Spacey for quite some time now. You can define your pipeline in the config system and then execute the training with a simple and consistent command, while still retaining the ability to change things in the command line if your workflow requires it. And once the model's trained, it can be converted into a Python package, giving you an easy way to ship it to production. Machine learning projects inherently consist of several steps. Even in the simplest case, you're going to run some sort of training process, save out the trained model, and then be loading it back in to predict with it. 
and in practice there are usually many more steps in the process. You might need to go over to Corpus before you create your models in order to build a vocabulary list. You might need to run some sort of data conversion, pre-processing or augmentation step. The new SPACY project system helps you keep those multi-stage projects organized. We're especially excited about how much easier this makes it to share and reuse work. Instead of everyone having to write their own scripts and instructions to run the various steps in their repo, we can all use a common standard. For the most common workflows, like training a named entity recognizer, you'll be able to clone one of our project templates, modify it for your data and requirements, and run it. And when it's time to ship your work to production, you'll have everything in a format that's super easy to automate. One thing I find especially satisfying about the Spacey project system is that it's actually really simple. The power comes mostly from introducing a structure and convention. The system itself only has to do a few simple things. There's really no magic to it. A Spacey project template is a YAML file that lets you declare assets, like input data or other files, commands, and multi-command workflows. For each command, you can list out the dependencies and outputs, like a make file. By declaring the dependencies, the Spacey project's command is able to skip commands if they don't need to be rerun, and raise helpful errors if something's missing. But the nicest thing is you can get really easy remote caching with two simple commands. Spacey project push uploads outputs to a remote storage of your choice, with an addressing system based on a file name, how it was created, and its contents. On a different machine, you can then do Spacey Project Pull, and it'll download what's available from your remote storage. This makes it really easy to share work with your colleagues, and it makes automating your work for production vastly easier. All the popular remote storages are supported, including S3, Azure, GCS, HTTPS, HDFS, and more. Here's what we expect everyday usage to look like. Once you've found a project template you want to work from, you'll use the spacey project clone command to create a local copy, just like git clone. At this point, you may want to edit the project template to point to your own data files, or customize the template to your requirements in some other way. Next, you'll run the spacey project assets command to download or verify the data required by the project. Project templates can point to assets hosted in lots of different ways, and can also describe assets without a source URL. You'll still need to get those into the right place yourself, but at least you'll know when they're missing. And if the project template specifies a checksum, it can also tell you whether you're working from the right version. Once you have the assets, you'll usually use the spacey project run command to execute a command or workflow, where a workflow is just a list of separate commands. As the steps are completed, the checksums of the outputs are saved for you in a little metadata file. This helps you replicate your work later and makes it easy for Spacey to check whether some step can be skipped, if the inputs haven't changed and the outputs are already as expected. To share your work, you can upload the outputs you've generated to a remote storage using the Spacey project push command. You don't need to specify any commit messages, version numbers or checkpoint names. It just uploads what's there with a clever indexing system that means you don't have to worry about overwriting your work. And if you want to share a project template with others, you can auto-generate a pretty readme that describes the project, its commands, and assets. Here's how a basic project.yaml file looks. We've tried to stick close to the format used by Azure Pipelines, BuildKite, and similar tools, so hopefully it won't be too surprising. The assets block defines the data assets used by the project and an optional URL or Git repo to download them from. If you provide a checksum, Spacey will show an error if the file exists but doesn't match. The workflows block lets you define named workflows, sequences of commands to run an order. Finally, the commands define the script to run and optional file dependencies. Probably the biggest inspiration for the Spacey project system was DVC, data version control. There's even an integration for DVC users to make it easy to use the two together. Integrations work really well with the Spacey project system because many tools in the ecosystem operate outside of your local Python installation. They're often services that help you fill in various parts of your workflow. For instance, when you're training a model and running different experiments, you typically want to track the results. Weights and Biases is a popular tool for this, and Spacey integrates with it out of the box, using a logger you can add to your training config. It will log the entire config, including all settings, hyperparameters, and even registered functions, so you always have a record of how your model was trained and how the different settings impact the results. One integration that should be particularly nice is with Ray, by far my favorite technology for parallel and distributed Python. I'm really excited by the type of algorithms Ray's actor model has let me explore. I still want to make some adjustments to get it performing well on more workloads, but I'm already seeing some promising results. 
Even without parallel training, you can use the Spacey Ray integration to seamlessly execute your job on remote computers, making it easy to schedule big jobs from the comfort of your laptop. Once you've finished training a model, you can also spin up an interactive Streamlit app to explore its predictions or compare it to other pipelines. Our Spacey Streamlit package provides building blocks for visualizing different components. You can also use it as a step in your project, so you can run Spacey Project Run Visualize to spin up an app with a pipeline trained in a previous step. Although it's not something users will notice immediately, what really pleases me about these integrations is how easy they've been. The integrations all work via the registry and entry point systems, designed to make it easy for anyone to extend Spacey. This is a really good sign for the future. I can't wait to see what integrations and extensions the community comes up with. The projects and config systems work together to let you set up and train powerful language understanding pipelines. A pipeline is a sequence of components. It's like an assembly line. The dock object travels along it, and each component does its bit of work updating the dock with new annotations. And at the end, the Doc API stores the annotations efficiently and makes it easy to use the different annotations together. Spacey has a good range of built-in components for tasks like named entity recognition, dependency parsing, part of speech tagging, text classification, and more. It's easy to add your own custom components, and you can even register extension attributes for the Doc object to make your annotations easier to work with. Components can be simple stateless things like functions, more complex rule-based systems, or they can be powered by machine learning models. Machine learning models definitely have the most specific requirements, and it's this type of component that's really driven the design of the pipeline system. One of the most important considerations is serialization. As we mentioned before, your machine learning model is pretty much always going to be trained in a separate process from when you use it. If you can't load your model back in, you don't have a model. So we work hard to make sure your pipeline can't get into a state that we wouldn't be able to get back to when deserializing. The config system is the key thing that makes this work. Here's part of a config file that describes some pipeline components. The NLP object will look up a factory function using its string name and create it with the arguments defined in the config. A subsection like model is just another argument. Here, it uses a model architecture created via the function registry system we talked about earlier. This example creates a transition-based named entity recognizer. Its model's token vector embedding layer is a transformer listener, which connects to the transformer component in the pipeline and allows multiple components to share the same transformer embeddings. The talk to vec layer also takes a pooling layer as an argument, in this case, reduce mean for mean pooling. All of these are things you can customize. You could, for instance, change the component to use a BIOS TM instead of a transformer, or you could change the final pooling strategy so that only the first word piece token is used, rather than the average. You can also implement an entirely custom model. For instance, you might make a sparse linear model like we had in Spacey v1. Or you can register an entirely new component. For instance, maybe you want a CRF-based named entity recognizer rather than a transition-based approach. Just as with normal code, it's extensible at several places. You can choose the abstraction at which you want to get involved. You can also reuse the weights or configuration of a component from another pipeline as a starting point. This can be useful to import pipeline components into a new pipeline, or to do things like domain adaptation or self-training. If you just want to import a component, for instance to reuse a named entity recognizer in a new text classification project, you can set the component's weights to frozen. This tells Spacey not to treat the component as usual and try and update it. These options fill in different workflows to make sure you can use the Spacey train command in most situations. There's also callbacks for different points in the lifecycle, too. If you need to train from code, you definitely can, and the abstractions there are easy to use, too. But generally, the Spacey train command should have you covered. In general, we've designed things so that you can always bring your own and have it work the same way as the built-ins we provide. Here's an example of how you can define your own pipeline components. If you're creating a stateless component, you can use the language.component decorator and the simple function that takes the doc, modifies it, and returns it. The string name you assign can be referenced in the config, or you can use it to add the component to the pipeline by calling nlp.addPipe. If your component needs to be configurable with settings and hold state, you can define a factory function that takes optional config settings and register it with the language.factory decorator. Here's an example of a factory you could implement to add a custom component for resolving acronyms. It always receives the current NLP object, so you can access the shared vocab. 
and the instance name of the component when it's added to the pipeline. Any other arguments can be provided via the config. Type hints let you define the expected types, by the way, so Spacey can make sure your settings always have the correct format and let you know if something is missing or wrong. The component and factory decorators are owned by the language class or subclass so that different language classes can have different defaults. If your language needs to have a different tagger, you can do that. So you're not limited by the choices we've made in the pipelines we train and distribute. For trained components, the most important type of customization you want to do is in the model. Spacey can communicate with models defined in major frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow and MXNet via our machine learning library Think. This was a key design goal we have for Think. It works as an interface layer between Spacey and other machine learning libraries by wrapping their models and acting as a shim. For example, Think's PyTorch wrapper layer takes a PyTorch model and returns a Think model instance. You can call this inside your registered functions to build up the Think model that you'll use to power your Spacey components. And in fact, this is how our transformer support works. We use the Hugging Face Transformers library and wrap their PyTorch models so they can be plugged into a Spacey component. The creation of your PyTorch model is up to you inside your registered function, and the communication with it all happens automatically within Think. This means that models from other frameworks really behave exactly the same as pure Think models, and they'll interact with the rest of the library just the same. You can specify configuration for them the same way in your config file, they train and serialize the same, and so on. We think this is very important. We want to make sure we don't make these models a second-class citizen that's compatible with some functionality but not others. Actually, that's something we pay a lot of attention to in the library in general. We want to make sure everything composes so that we don't need to introduce parallel workflows to work around the incompatibilities. Another aspect of developer experience we've been paying a lot of attention to is error handling and validation. In Spacey 3, we finally dropped support for Python 2, so we were able to embrace some of the newer Python features, like type hints. Type hints let you define the expected types of variables. For instance, adding colon in to a function parameter lets you declare that the value should be an integer. Static type checkers like MyPy can then analyze your code and point out potential mistakes, and modern editors can offer hints and autocomplete. The goal is prevent mistakes as they happen. Under the hood, machine learning means passing fairly abstract, multidimensional arrays back and forth and performing computations with them. A single mismatch of input-output dimension often means hours of painful debugging, and a single hyperparameter being set inconsistently can have a big impact on the entire network and lead to confusing results or everything falling apart. Think provides type annotations for model definitions that let you annotate the expected input and output types and make it easy to keep track of the data passing through the network. Model here is a generic type that lets you specify the expected input and output types of the layer. The library also includes various custom array types, like Floats2D for an array of two-dimensional floats, Ints1D for a one-dimensional array of integers, and custom types and data classes for padded and ragged arrays. Here's an example of a layer's forward pass that annotates its expected return type as a tuple of Floats1D array and a callable to compute the backwards pass. Within the function, the input array is reshaped and returned, together with the backprop callback. If you're using a modern editor with a static type checker, you'll immediately see a type error here. The reshape operation expects to return a three-dimensional array, whereas the function annotates a one-dimensional array. So there's clearly something wrong here. This type of mistake is very subtle and also very common, and could easily cost you hours or days of debugging time, especially if it happens deep down in your network. Some of the most common problems you'll find yourself debugging when writing neural network models are mismatched input and output types. To help with this, Think provides a plugin for the static type checker MyPy that performs additional checks, like comparing the expected output of one layer to the expected input of the next layer when using the chain combinator. The ecosystem around this is still quite young and actively developing, and we'll likely see a lot more of this in the future. Even aside from the actual validation errors, I've been finding it really nice to have a succinct notation to document the input and output types of the layers I'm working with. It makes planning out the network much easier, and makes it quite clear which layers can be swapped out for which others. And this was always a big part of the motivation for Python's type hints. Python doesn't care what variable names you choose, but you'll quickly confuse yourself and your colleagues if you don't choose wisely. Similarly, the computer won't always be able to take full advantage of your type annotations to catch every possible error. But if you write them out anyway, maybe you will. 
So unless you regularly read machine learning code and think, wow, why did they waste so much time making this clear? It's all super obvious. Try adding the type hints. It can definitely help. So that's what's in Spacey 3 and why it's there. We've been learning a lot from helping Spacey grow and evolve the last five years, and we've been really looking forward to sharing it with you. Spacey comes with built-in base support and trained pipelines for many languages, and lets you train your own models on your own custom data. You can use the latest modern NLP techniques and efficiently share large transformer weights between components using multitask learning. Spacey has always been one of the fastest libraries for NLP, and it's designed to be easy to deploy and optimized for production workloads. It features a range of built-in components for various NLP tasks, including name entity recognition, part of speech tagging, dependency parsing, text classification, entity linking, and more. You can put together the components into custom pipelines and easily define your own components for arbitrary tasks. Components can be rule-based using a robust and efficient matching engine, or you can train your own pipeline components using Spacey's production-ready training system. And once your model is ready, Spacey's workflow management and model packaging makes it easy to develop your NLP application all the way from prototype to production. One of the aspects of Spacey we're most proud of is the awesome ecosystem of plugins and extensions that's grown up around the library. Now with all the new features and configurability, we're looking forward to seeing the ecosystem evolve even further. So I hope you'll try it out and let us know what you build. All right, thank you, Anderson, Matt. That was a really good presentation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad we we uh, used that one rather than try to do something in live. I think that, that covered a lot in, in a really short amount of time. Um, so now what we can open it up to a general Q&A session. And just a, a reminder for everyone, um, we are recording right now. Um, it'll be up to the presenters to decide whether or not we publish this later. Uh, we do want to hear everybody's question. So if you have a question um, and you don't want to be on video, uh, please let us know this in the text chat. The text chat will be part of the recording. Um, and I can ask the question on, on your behalf um, so that you can still get your, your question answered. Um, so it looked looks like um uh it doesn't matter being answering questions in the chat already so um happy to turn it over to to you to um answer the questions in the chat and, and invite people to uh to speak them out loud and uh we can we can take it from there yeah yeah so should we just go ahead and um answer yeah yeah go ahead and, and, and yeah, invite, so invite, invite, invite go ahead cool because yeah, so there's one question in the chat um, that says, I love the sequential processing pipeline concept in Spacey and have been exploring the custom components capability. Is it possible to keep the doc type consistent when a new custom component is added at various stages of the processing pipeline? Um, so I hope I understand the question correctly. Um, in general, yes, the doc type, it's always a doc that travels to the pipeline and you can add annotations to it. And the doc always represents the original text and typically, you know, you, it just passes through the pipeline and, um, you know, you have, can use custom attributes to store whatever your custom component is doing. So um, that ensures that you always know what comes in, what goes out, and you can really make this doc object the single source of truth of your application um, and run everything, program against it, basically. I hope I, hope I understood the question correctly um, and the consistent, uh, the doc, keeping the doc type consistent. If not, feel free to um, clarify. Yeah, so just, um, you know, expanding on that a, a little further, like one of the things that, you know, we think about developing a library like Spacey is, um, you know, what role should the library have? Or like, what are the things that should be in the library as opposed to like in a wider ecosystem of things? And we think in general, it's very good for libraries to think about data structures and providing, uh, you know, good implementations of core data structures. And so we see uh, the doc object and, you uh, you know, it's interaction with like the token and span and everything is really like the heart of the library and the, some of the core value of uh, what we provide. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we actually didn't talk about in uh, this video that we've uh, been doing around this as well is uh, extending the doc object with some more native uh, container types that allow uh, storing more arbitrary annotations. So there's a new span groups uh, container that lets you store, uh, you know, sort of 
multiple arbitrary, like and potentially overlapping spans that when you are writing custom components, you've got a nice place to write those things to. And an undocumented feature that we are going to be rolling out uh, more support for as well as um, a similar, but support for uh, graphs of uh, relationships. So this is something that you know we really see as uh, at the heart of what we're trying to do with Spacey and uh, have other components and uh, uh, you know things that can write uh, some of these arbitrary things. Um, ah, yeah, here's a question from um, Brad. Um, I have to ask, when will Spacey flip on one oh, In this, you're, you're, oh, you're, oh, you're a little echoey here. I think it might help if oh. you, yeah, I think we're getting you through Matt's mic. Um, oh, so okay. you might want to yeah. unmute. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, can that, we... That sounded a little bit better. Ah, yeah, this is better? Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, the question is, um, when will Spacey flip on one be released and will it coincide with the next release of Prodigy? Um, so yeah, uh, the, the answer about Prodigy, yes, um, we've actually been waiting on Spacey 3.1 and some of the features we're building for that um, to uh, be able to release the new version of Prodigy, which will let you use uh, transformer-based pipelines um, in Prodigy to have like, much, much better training and uh, some other cool uh, features, new UIs for annotating overlapping spans, um, which you know is now possible in Spacey with the span groups that Matt uh, just talked about. Um, and we're actually, we're actually currently working on getting 3.1 out. Like, I don't want to give like a specific time estimate. We kind of, yeah, we really hope we can do it next week. Um, but yeah, we're now, I don't know, this releasing a bigger version is always a bit involved with, you know, we're building all these wheels for all these different platforms. Um, so, but yeah, we hope um, we can get it out quite soon. And then, yes, there'll definitely be a new property. All right, there's a, a question here that someone's asked me to read out. Um, when is uh, Spacey going to be able to generate English text? Actually, I'm going to generalize this question. When um, when can Spacey be used for, for language generation more broadly? I guess there's a little bit of that right now in, in some of the uh, models, but, but I mean, maybe they're thinking more like the, the GPT uh, type model. Yeah, models. because I would, I would be like, I'm thinking, I, you know, my first response to that would have been never, because it's really, <laughs> um, or like at least not, you know, you know, not quite like that, but um, in Spacey, we really believe in having a very tight uh, scope and focus of what the library does and doesn't do. And Spacey is a library for analyzing and processing text, not necessarily generating text. So we kind of see text generation um, just as a, you know, end-to-end -end task as outside of the scope of the core library. But of course, it does, it, you could still have components that output something generated in the different attributes. Um, and um, do stuff like that, but um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, basically if we think about the, uh, you know, the data types and things that are uh, being passed around in the uh, NLP pipeline, the like NLP object is, you know, sort of this function that uh, it maps from a string into a doc object. And uh, then the pipeline components are all things which are going to take a doc object and like modify it. Uh, and you know, add annotations to it. So if these are the basic like you know function signatures in the library, uh, then something which uh, you know takes text and uh, outputs text as its you know mission is going to be something that maybe consumes an NLP pipeline, but is a function of a, like a different type. And so that's something that you know if there is functionality in Spacey that's useful in that goal, that would be something that you know you could implement as another library uh, alongside Spacey and. Uh, so far, we haven't had any especially clever ideas that other people haven't thought of for uh, text generation that would uh, really be well suited to uh, either moving something into uh, those core data structures, so something which needs to be in the library itself as opposed to just functions alongside it, or even just, you know, algorithms and things that have made us want to publish our own library of, you know, spacey text generation or something. So we see it as, you know, an opportunity to keep the library smaller and not have something just to, you know, answer these, you know, use cases that could easily be written uh, uh, by somebody else in some other way. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, uh, I think this uh, question by Stephen McKinney is, McKinney is uh, interesting. So uh, uh, we haven't uh, ourselves been using Rasa to build uh, chat applications. The functionality that is referred to there is, uh, you know, um, uh, how the Rasa package constructs pipelines to allow components to be able to interact with earlier and later components. Now, this is actually a puzzle that we've had to uh, think about in Spacey and having uh, this type of 
interaction over components is uh, a difficult problem. So if they've got a nice solution to that, that's definitely something to like to check out. Uh, but I don't know how the solution works at the moment, so yeah. I couldn't comment on this. Yeah, but in general, um, yeah, we've definitely had like you know these problems of okay, how do you you know how do you construct the pattern? How do you manage these dependencies? And also, you might have one component that some other component depends on. How do you express that? We've introduced some of that in um, Stacy three that basically lets you say this component requires these annotations, and then if it's not there, you can analyze it and see the problems. Um, there are also ways that you can, for example, mark. Um, entities as kind of open or like you can you can basically say well I have I know about these two tokens but I don't know anything about the rest and then a later component can potentially fill in these gaps or with the NER model can for instance um, take into account annotations that are already set and kind of predict around them so if you have a you have a rule that can set some entities and then you can um, uh, improve the accuracy potentially but um, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely tricky to do that in a performant way, um, while also making it intuitive to the user. Because that's another thing. Like you, you know, you always want to be able to understand what happens along the way when the doc passes through the pipeline. I just uh, add add to that, Steve. If you want to uh, find out more about how Rasa do this, uh, stay tuned. They they are going to be. Uh, present in a Bay Area NLP uh, either next month or the, the month after. Uh, I haven't announced that yet. So you're, you're hearing it here for the uh, for the first time. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, they also have their own um, event, the L3 AI, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, also going to be online and we'll have lots of talks by them. Yeah, so I think it's in, um, in two weeks. Um, and yeah, I'll be speaking at that as well. Yep. I'll be talking about practical NLP and how to, how to think in applied NLP, basically. So yeah, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, it'll be a great way to uh, engage with them and uh, you know understand that better. Um, so yeah, uh, I saw this question from Marley. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, what do you do to stay on top of industry trends, and uh, how do you go about planning features around new innovations? So I think this is a super interesting question. It's something that uh, comes up for everybody, and uh, I actually think that we have a strategy to. Uh, you know, individual uh, machine learning engineers in industry might consider for themselves. So our answer for this is to wait. Um, so in, in general, uh, whenever you're working with uh, the output of the research community, uh, you're always going to be um, trying to decide, okay, which of these, you know, many techniques is going to be one which is going to prove significant over time. So, you know, if you're staying up to the minute with papers, uh, it's, it's impossible that you could look at every paper, right? So you're always trying to guess is this paper going to be one which is going to be built on? Well, no method that you possibly could use for that is going to be better than waiting. So if you wait six months, you can see which of those papers actually work, uh, is starting to get built on. And if you wait even longer, then you'll have an even more accurate uh, sense of that. And the pruning that you'll see from that is going to be way better. And, you know, again, it's absolutely impossible that you could possibly uh, outperform that metric. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is like, is it important for me that I stay up to the minute as opposed to waiting six months? And I think it's pretty much impossible that, you know, somebody in industry could really need to stay up to the minute as opposed to being six months behind. And similarly for Spacey, even just the considerations of shipping that software and, um, you know, building on things means that, you know, there's no real reason for us to read the research that's like, produced today as opposed to the research that was coming out like six months ago. And this is something that you might consider in your own work as well. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, good observation. I'd say most of industry are just starting to trial transformers <laughs> in, in, in different areas, which is you know, probably the right level of caution. Um, so yeah, you, you definitely have have some time to to wait and see what what sticks. Um, yeah, yeah and also we, what often what some people in the industry don't necessarily understand is that like well whatever comes out of research isn't even um, you know the, the thing that you should necessarily be using or like people um, uh, oh is it uh, people uh, people you know often have this idea of like oh whatever comes out of the papers I want to inject that straight into my veins and like use this yeah. immediately even <laughs> though it was developed with some very different ideas in mind or like you know normally what research focuses on are problems that are very hard and if they're not hard enough the problems are made harder that's quite different from how um you're solving problems in industry yeah 
another consideration is that in any good paper, you ideally want to change exactly one thing because you want to have a clean comparison of the idea that you're presenting there. And, you know, uh, it's good that research papers do this and like do it carefully because then you can see cleanly the impact of like this one thing that they're doing. And in practice, it's difficult to only change one thing because that, you know, all of the things that we're doing kind of interrelate. And so, you know, in practice, the papers which are getting state of the art do change multiple things, but they try to keep that absolutely to a minimum. And so this means that no single paper that's coming out is actually, uh, you know, the best combination of things that you should be using usually, um, or the best combination of ways to do things or, uh, and, or that sort of, you know, basically synthesis. And so um, it's also, you know, worth keeping in mind how the different purposes of like, you know, a research paper interact with what that code is and like how, you know, the decisions that were made there, like, you know, you might say, why are all the transformers width 768? Is that like the exact perfect width? It's like, well, no, because it's a fine width and it's the width that people have been using. Like why make your thing just like arbitrarily different in width? Um, that just is an annoying, like, you know, point of difference from all of the other ones. Um, it's not that that's, you know, the one perfect true width. It's that that's not an interesting parameter to vary in a paper uh, because we don't learn anything from that. Yeah. Cool. So there's one more question here by Michelle. Um, are there any plans to add more native task support to space, e.g. core reference resolution, et cetera? And yeah, the answer is yes, absolutely. That's something we'd be focusing on. In fact, we do have... Uh, PR currently under construction that will add core reference uh, to Spacey as a component you can train. We also have a component coming up for more general purpose spam prediction. So often what people want to do is they just want a model that predicts arbitrary spans that can overlap and just express some concept. Um, and make something like named entity recognition is just the wrong tool for that, where you're predicting token-based tags uh, where boundaries are very important. So we actually have a component um, that just lets you predict spans in the text, which we think will be very useful for a lot of the applied stuff people are doing. Um, and yeah, they also um, some other um, areas we're looking into and we'll be focusing on more like um, lexical semantics. That's another thing. Um, what else am I, am I forgetting anything that? Um, uh, so in general, I think that, you know, the way to sort of predict what uh, built-in components will have that will have models themselves is uh, we're really targeting uh, tasks which are, you know, basically linguistic or language internal, uh, you know, annotations. So there's a logic behind what is a part of speech tag or like, you know, what's a uh, dependency parse, et cetera, that generalizes between tasks. These are things which are linguistic annotations that are reusable between different tasks. And, you know, you might want to fine tune or retrain the model on different domains or something, but, and, you know, there might be reasons why some people would prefer one annotation scheme than another, but the task is fundamentally the same. There's, you know, an answer for what is, whether this word is a noun in English or a verb, and that answer is independent of the task. And so for that reason, we see it as useful to ship uh, models for like things like part of speech tagging, lemmatization, morphological analysis, et cetera, where you wouldn't really expect us to be producing something like sentiment analysis models, because we don't see sentiment analysis as really a language internal, like, I, uh, you know, question. It's a question about like how you interpret this text with respect to some task. Uh, so we have components for things like text classification, but we won't have trained models for them. And, uh, you know, our priority is really to be producing uh, these components for these linguistic tasks that we see as reusable. So co-reference is absolutely on the list. Semantic parsing to the extent that it's like a predicate argument structure we see as something is very you know, useful to have a good uh, general solution. We see it as something where we need to have our own data assets to uh, do well at it uh, and to produce something that's really reusable. Uh, but we also, uh, to address uh, another question that I see in the chat from Jeff Tang, uh, you know, what's the best way to do semantic parsing? Uh, so semantic parsing, I think it's useful to think of it as like, okay, is it any uh, type of task where you have uh, the text is input and you're just producing an arbitrary graph of relations at the end. So the thing here is that there's many different types of graphs or graph properties that you could have, like how dense are the connections? Is it that, um, you know, you've got a semantic parse and there's only like three arcs over the whole sentence. Uh, that's a very different type of structure to predict than something with, you know, really dense uh, 
arcs and like, you know, uh, potentially it's uh, non-projective and potentially, uh, you know, each word often has multiple parents. That type of structure is quite different. And so the best way to structure a component for it is going to be different. Um, I think for a lot of tasks, trying to think of what is the graph structure that I want and how can I limit it in certain ways that actually still let my application work well is actually going to be the key to doing those things well in an application. So for instance, if you can have a thing where you think you need semantic parsing, but actually you can get by with uh, you know, something with a syntactic parse and then rules on top or some other post-processing, that's often going to be a really practical solution to that and leveraging the syntax better, or at least aligning your annotations to the syntax is uh, things which you know, tend to make your annotations more consistent and then, uh, you know, help you really produce components that learn more consistently as well. All right, so it looks like we're, we're out of questions there. So in that case, I would I would love to build on the, the, the previous one. There was one. one more, there was um, one more in between. You, oh, there is one more? Uh, well. Oh, well, that's more about like, you know, NLP academia and things. I don't think we're actually even the best people to comment on that. I've, <laughs> I, I would say that, I'm glad to not be publishing NLP papers at the moment. I think that, you know, the, um, in some sense, the standard is actually very high um, for the work that's coming out. And so, you know, I think people are, you know, quite critical about some of the things, some of the dynamics about what's going on there. But, you know, I look at the standards that are, are being set to, you know, what's acceptable work and what work is getting published now. And I think that the bar is actually very high in many ways. Um, so, yes, I think that it's unfortunate that there's so much publication pressure and the field is growing in certain ways, but I'm not the best person to comment on it. Yeah, I had a, I had a paper last year at EMNLP. I was an independent oh, researcher congrats. At, the, at the time. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And it, no one was compelling me to do it. I'm not in academia either. I just saw something important. <laughs> yeah, thought, thought, I should, I thought I should write about it. Uh, so, Steve, mm -hmm. to, to answer your question, there's at least one paper out there that I know was not published or perish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, can't, I can't speak for the, I can't speak for the, the rest of them. Um, so, so this, for, was your, um, this was your gender bias pronouns work, right? Like, we still haven't addressed that, actually, in Spacey. I, this is something that I'd really like to get somebody working on. Um, I think it's a... Yeah, um, really, was, was that in the Ontonauts data? Which oh, just in general, is the outputs yeah. of the models. So, yeah. if I yeah, could... so every I, this is not about me, but um, the the short of it was that we found that every major positive for the last twenty years had failed to identify that hers, theirs, and themselves were uh, pronouns. Um, and given all the attention paid to English and the pronouns in particular and bias, it was really surprising that this hadn't been noticed. Um, yeah. And one of the reasons that it was missed um, was the different declensions you get. In, in different genders of the neutral in English, um, and that um, bias are also perpetuated in uh, mass language models, where mm -hmm. differences in, in human language that aren't biases do become biases because the different generalizations that are made by, by language models. That's, that's the paper in a nutshell. Uh, yeah. Fun thing to write um, and important yeah. to get out, which yeah. is no, why we, we think, did Actually, this, this, this also shows why we think it's very important we want to be creating our own um, data assets, build better better models, because yeah, if you look at it, we, it's kind of embarrassing that everyone's still training on these corpora from like, yeah. I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, and, and not enough people are looking at it critically, clearly for, for some obvious things to, to, to skip by, but, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, even though I wrote that paper and I run this meetup, I'm not presenting that paper. I I, I think it's interesting that was the right venue, but I'm, I'm more interested in the broader practical implications. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so that, yeah, brings me to the question I wanted to ask. Uh, what are the really fun, interesting, recent new uses for Spacey that you've heard about? You must hear about all kinds of fun companies and examples. Um, uh, of, of people taking your library and and you must think oh I never realized that uh, <laughs> we could do that so I'd love to hear yeah. about some of those. I mean at first as a kind of disclaimer or like the irony is often that like the, the, the areas where NLP really makes the most difference and delivers the biggest value are also the ones that sound the least exciting to people like I often get people ask who ask me like oh what are the most exciting um like wow factor things that people are building and it's well, I don't know, the most exciting, if you're looking at like, you know, what the technology can actually do, it's, it might be a bit lame if I, 
taught you that. It's, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, often I think a lot of the interesting things are not necessarily the ones that are like, whoa, galaxy brain AI. Um, yeah. So I would say that uh, we definitely have a special love for our digital humanities users. Yes. Um, so the community there is super active and there's like uh, people publishing these great tutorials all the time. Uh, you know, I think if you look on YouTube, there's uh, a couple of great video series that have been associated with courses in digital humanities. So broadly, this is areas where, uh, you know, people are using language data to, you know, investigate, um, you know, questions about society and, uh, you know, uh, uh, any, everything over the social sciences um, or the humanities more broadly if they're interacting with literature and uh, those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, the data there at a phenomena is often like, you know, exactly language. And I, I see it as just this great uh, thing where you come in the, in order to answer those questions, you really have to be coming in from them with, you know, a view for what those questions are and, you know, caring about the questions primarily. And so it's really a good situation where, um, you know, people, uh, people coming in from M NLP or something who are like, oh, I've got this algorithm, what should I do with it? Are never going to really do something that's so apt on those things. You have to be starting from the question. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we're very uh, pleased for Spacey to uh, be delivering uh, tools that are usable enough and uh, sufficient enough that people who, uh, you know, don't have this as their primary specialization, uh, you know, can pick them up and uh, get productive use out of them for the questions that, you know, are often very important. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's also, I've always found it quite exciting to see, like, how any type of company nowadays uh, uses NLP. Or we also see that with like our commercial product, which is Prodigy, which is an annotation tool for creating training data for machine learning models. So typically our customers and users, they are people who are really serious about training their own models and running their own experiments. And um, yeah, we see the type of companies from like all kinds of Fortune 100, 500 to like, you know, of course you yeah. have like tech startups that make sense, but there are lots of companies where I'm like, yeah, of course I know that company, they know what they do, but I never thought about what they would be doing with NLP and that is yeah. really across all industries. Um, and yeah, often, yeah, what people do there might not be the most fancy, <laughs> um, exciting thing, but it's really, you know, yeah. stuff like optimizing internal processes, making, um, reducing variance, making humans work more efficiently. That's all, um, I yeah. think that's a big focus, especially in the larger um, enterprise yeah. company. And then, you know, so, that, so just to think, Think of two specific projects that so these aren't so recent, but they're two of, two of my favorite would be one there was um, a project using uh, it's basically another NLP uh, models to investigate reports of deaths in custody uh, in the US and basically finding from uh, uh, local news reportage uh, cases where there were under reports of uh, deaths in custody from the official statistics. Uh, so this was worked by Peter Baumgartner uh, in association with RTI, uh, where he's been working. And then another one was uh, Spacey was um, used in combination with many other open source tools to investigate uh, comments posted uh, in response to uh, the net neutrality question. Uh, so this was thrown open to, you know, open comment on the internet and uh, the uh, researchers showed that these uh, feedbacks were uh, manipulated by showing that the, uh, you know, feedback in favor of, uh, uh, well. In the favor of repealing net neutrality. Yeah, in, in favor US, of yeah. like repealing net neutrality uh, were, uh, you know, basically astroturfed and uh, yeah. generated. Yeah, we, we could just right. say that the bad side was astroturfed. I don't think we need to take a neutral position. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. sure. This, actually, this, this research actually directly, I think led to the attorney general like opening an investigation into this. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of, well, actually journalism use case in general, that's also something we think I, I always really like. Yeah, yeah. Th those are both both really good use cases. I, I love the um, the underreporting case. I've, I've previously, we should have used Spacey, we didn't. I've previously done that for um, epidemic tracking, not for COVID, but, but previously uh, identify yeah. when governments are underreporting. Um, yeah, so yeah, incredibly important. Um, yeah, that, that can literally save lives. Um, use case, so yeah, that, that's yeah. really that's really good. All right, we're we're almost at time here. Um, uh, actually, we're over. I, we, I appreciate the, the extra time. Um, uh, so there was one question which I'll I'll, I'll paraphrase. 
um, which is uh, super important. Uh, how do people give you money? So um, <laughs> in, in, in what ways can people in, in engage uh, uh, Explosion commercially? Um, yeah, so we have, um, as I mentioned previously, we have a commercial product, which is called Prodigy, which we sell. So you can buy that. It's really, you know, this old school software model where you can pay money and then you get a piece of software and you own it and you can use it. And, you know, it's great. You just have it like back in the day uh, when you could like actually buy Photoshop. Um, so uh, that's that's currently, that's how we've been funding the company for the past few years. Um, and yeah, we've been very pleased to yeah, see Prodigy um uh become very popular in the industry um and it's being used by like hundreds of companies and um yeah that's that's mainly that's what we do commercially we have other products planned um around that so we have a version of prodigy coming up which is uh a bit closer to a software as a service um tool so you know you do you can log in have an account you can um, manage multiple annotators scale up your projects um, but you still have this kind of private cloud aspect where you run your data on your own hardware in your own cluster in on your cloud so nothing ever has to leave your servers you can script it in python and that's going to be yeah that, that's currently what we're very busy with and we're hoping to release that very soon but yeah in general we're a developer tools company and we build tools uh, that make people and develop, especially developers in ai more productive and in return people give us money for that which we can then use to fund our open source work Okay, yeah, appreciate that. Really looking forward to uh, upcoming release of Prodigy then. Uh, we're excited to, to see how that uh, that tool has been developing. Um, and for the, the VCs lurking on the line, um, you're not looking for funding right now then? <laughs> no, not, not at the moment. All right, all right, fair enough. Um, if you can, if you don't need it, you should definitely not take it. No offense to my, my investor friends. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're at time. So, th uh, thank you again, Innes and Matt for, um, uh, for, for coming and answering our questions today and for getting up early or like, I guess, engineering early, um, <laughs> in, in, in Melbourne, uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. And hopefully, um, we can talk about, uh, V4 or the new releases of Prodigy next time you're right here in the Bay. Yep. Yeah. Certainly. All right. Okay, well, thanks again for having us. Bye, all. Thank you.